Uh, with that, I'm going to switch over now to um, Jeff Houston Stock. Again, he couldn't be here with us today, but he did send us um, a recorded presentation that uh, I'm going to kick off right now. Jeff Houston, for those of you who don't know, is the chief scientist at APNIC, which is the regional internet registry for the Asia Pacific region. Uh, he was instrumental in the development of Australia's internet um, throughout the last 20, 30 years as, uh, as the internet grew up in, in Australia. Hi, my name's Jeff Houston. I'm sorry I can't make it here this afternoon uh, to be with you in person, but um, hopefully this uh, slide pack will uh, suffice. Um, so I'll launch straight away. Um, you know, we work in an industry that is undoubtedly one of the most largest and long-standing industries the world has ever seen. The telecommunications industry can date itself back to at least uh, the 1830s with the advent of the wireless telegraph and then the late 19th century with the telephone and throughout the entire 20th century where the telephone became one of the largest uh, industries on the planet. Uh, in America at its peak AT&T employed I understand around half a million people. So this industry has a remarkably rich history and most of the time the choices were good but some of the time their choices were abysmal. Um, no one could ever say that ATM was a good idea and their concept of broadband delivering to every user a phenomenal 64 kilobits per second could only be described as banging the rocks together. So for such a large industry it was never really an industry that always made the rocks and sometimes their choices were really quite abysmal and the surprises were amazing. No one ever thought that SMS was ever going to be anything other than a weird esoteric way of sending tiny control messages from one telephone operator to another. Oh yeah. And IP itself was a mistake that really just an experiment that escaped from the lab. It completely took this industry by surprise. So <clears throat> the internet itself was a surprise and it was a surprise not only to this sector but it was I think a surprise to everybody that all of a sudden this combination, this marriage of computing and communications has become a marriage that is truly revolutionary. And fascinatingly, just as we now get into this area of ubiquity of the internet, we're about to blow it up. Because one of the most vital components of the internet, the underlying address space, is running out. We're about used up most of that 32-bit address pool. And that's a massive problem. Of course, nothing I'm telling you is news. Oddly enough, we've known about this problem not just for the last five years or the last 10 years, but for basically the last 23 years. Here's a slide pack um, from August 1990. Um, <laughs> We didn't use PowerPoint back then. <laughs> in, in fact, we couldn't even print on these overhead transparencies. Uh, it was all hand done. Uh, isn't it beautiful? But what it does say is it's from Frank Selinsky in August 1990. And what it's saying is, if we continue the way that we're going, we're going to run out of addresses. When? Well, we were using classful addresses at the time, so the apocalypse was going to happen sometime in the late 1990s, early 2000s. So what did we do with this terrible news? Well at the time addresses were structured into fixed host and networking parts. Class A, 8 bits of network, 24 bits of host, B, C, etc. And one of the quick band-aids was to just remove that fixed boundary and allow the network part and the host part to be variable classless interdomain routing appeared and it hit the internet in um, March 1993 as I recall and all of a sudden the trajectory of address usage changed dramatically. This slide actually shows the history from uh, the early 1980s and you saw the advent of the National Science Foundation's network, the NSFnet and then the pickup by academic and research networks all over the globe 
and then you see the advent of cider where the address consumption started to slow down and a new trajectory was put in place that gave us, we hoped, just that couple more years that would help. So now that we'd bought that time, we thought, right, it's time to work on a new protocol, IPv6. How would we transition? Well, depends on what the protocol is going to be like. So we left that comfortably aside and said, you know, we're going to figure that out once we've figured out what the protocol is going to look like. We had a plan. We'd solved the immediate problem. We went to sleep. And for a long while, it just didn't seem to be an urgent problem. Because CIDA didn't just work. It didn't just buy a couple of years. By the late 1990s, it looked like CIDA would buy us a future that would span 50 years. That the address consumption levels, even at the height of the internet boom in the year 2000, was such that we were looking at running out in about 2050. We'd all have retired. It wasn't our problem. So all of a sudden we just stopped working on any active transition to V6. We developed the protocol. That was fine. It was ready and waiting when we needed it. And that wasn't today. Oh, how silly we were. Because the boom and bust wasn't really the boom. The boom happened in the mid-2000s. And it was really that transition from those weird analog modems, which were truly inventions of the devil, uh, into ubiquity of DSL. DSL was indeed a transformative technology and broadband fueled a massive deployment exercise across huge parts of the world and that in turn gobbled up huge amounts of addresses. But even that wasn't quite enough because in the mid 2000s we also started the next thing which was mobiles and if we had any theory addresses would last for a long time, the mobile industry said, no, you are completely wrong. We are going to give everybody a mobile with IP. And they started. And all of a sudden, that IPv4 address bank that was going to last for 50 years wasn't. Because all of a sudden, we hit exhaustion. The first signal of that was in February 2011, where all of a sudden IANA was triggered to give out its last address blocks. It was news. It was news because it wasn't expected. This was a surprise. This was a dramatic oops moment. And now when we look at this picture, what we see is that APNIC, dark blue, panicked in early 2011 and went through the equivalent of seven slash eights, or 100 million addresses, in a few short months and ran out in April 2011. With the Europeans, uh, there wasn't such panic. I suspect the whole European economic crisis sort of acted against large pools of money, but inevitably they reached their last slash eight in September 2012. Um, the Aaron trajectory is kind of interesting. Um, it slowed down a lot. In fact, it slowed down in late 2010. But Aaron and Lachnick are both well on course to reach their last slash eight uh, in mid-2014. And Afrinik has a somewhat lower trajectory. Um, that's still some time away. So all of a sudden, though, we've run out of addresses. All of a sudden, transition to IPv6 is not a tomorrow problem. It's a today problem. And what we really should worry about now is that this is not just a few people. This is the huge mainstream telecommunications industry. This is the industry that bought you ATM, that bought you ISDN, that thought that Frame Relay was good enough. This is the industry that was totally taken by surprise with SMS and IP. This is an industry that really looks dumber than it is. Or maybe it is that dumb. How's it going to go with this transition? Do we need to worry about this? One view is that IPv6 will just happen. I make like, addresses get scarce, we can't build any more v4 networks, and exhaustion gets to the right level intensity. It's all just going to happen. Well, maybe not. 
let's look a bit closer you know when we go back along a fair way back into the start of the 20th century what we saw is that the telephone network was composed of wires lots of wires and the real technology of the time was actually building poles tall enough and strong enough to hold all that copper up in the air inevitably that was never going to work and what we got to was sharing the one wire was shared amongst multiple users simultaneously through the concept of virtual circuitry in other words this whole business of building exchanges that actually did time switching and that pushed multiple conversations into a single wire what the internet did was move that to a second form of sharing the idea of packets where instead of actually trying to put all these conversations simultaneously over the wire you chopped the conversations up and each conversation shared the used the entire wire for a very small amount of time all of a sudden these networks were not analog frequency controlling networks or even time switching networks they were computer based controlled networks they were packet switch networks so it all looks rather inevitable but maybe not maybe that inevitability is actually all about cost efficiency that the new technology actually created opportunities by reducing cost so in economic terms we can model this with a supply demand curve that where we have the old technology circuits then the demand curve and the supply curve are all based around the economics of voice but IP is very flexible it can do more things you can do more than just talk into it so all of a sudden the demand curve increases in volume and interestingly it strips functionality out of the network so it's cheaper to build larger networks all of a sudden the folk running IP have a competitive advantage over the folk doing time switching this created if you will a new set of demand all that creates ultimately is a new equilibrium point in that supply demand schedule all of a sudden everyone's doing IP because it's cheaper it's more efficient and that's what people want so what was inevitability was actually economics so could we look at the same issue of this transition that the transition from IPv4 to IPv6 is simply inevitable so let's zero in on that leap of faith from one protocol to the next so we have a few options of how to do this one is what we did back in January 1983 we all turned off NCP as I recall and turned on TCP overnight so what if we all agree how about tomorrow to turn off V4 everywhere all over the planet and turn on V6 and we'll all do it at midnight GMT all over the internet all at once yeah right the internet is just way too big to even dream about that kind of flag day that's not an option so how about parallel transition we start to slide in IPv6 in parallel with v4 and then as v4 sort of wanes we gradually pull it out so the network just doesn't even really notice that there's been this transition from one protocol to the next well for that to work and work well you've got to get to the point where everyone runs IP before we run out of v4 we have to start early and finish early we have to avoid exhaustion whoops it's incredibly difficult for markets to plan without clear price signals we never priced future scarcity into the internet model addresses are still dirt cheap so that the exploitation model continues to use v6 even though the signals of impending exhaustion were there for 10 years we hoped that the operators were so smart they'd just ignore the pricing signals and actually understand what risk was all about oh we were wrong so it's too late for that so now we have to do this hybrid model of trying to force v4 into some weird address extension model we're forcing the carriage providers to add address sharing mechanisms deep in the heart of their networks
that gnats are no longer a tool at the edge. Gnats are a tool at the middle. Now from there though it doesn't stop because perhaps from there we have to move into an even stronger model of address conservatism and go into the model of application level gateways where in effect we buffer up the transaction and then spin it out onto the public network in due course. And that leads us to a transition map that looks awfully complicated. That we go from carrier grade NATs and actually trying to use still an end to end model into a model which has more dense use of content distribution networks and similar kind of buffering models and all the way through perhaps even into application level gateways and relive the hell that was networking in the 1980s all because we've run out of v4 addresses the longer it takes to get to this transition sorry to get to v6 the more convoluted this transition is going to be so will we get there all of a sudden we're asking the industry to undertake large amounts of capital investment in technologies that are really short term all of a sudden instead of trying to get a 20 year life out of the silicon instead of trying to get a 10 year life out of the silicon if this all goes according to plan maybe you've got to spend all those millions of dollars for just five years all of a sudden the capital investment model that carriers use has changed but have the carry is the carrier itself changed the real question is that once you start investing in carrier grade nets once you start investing in this transition technology then are your future interests all about preserving the lifetime of the transition and not v6 at all at what point do you lock yourself into this transition for an indefinite period and indeed are we so good at perfecting brokenness that we get to this point in networking where we've built a network that's only the web and nothing else that everything runs on application level gateways you know, well good enough who needed this end-to-end -end junk anyway that all of a sudden we head off in a completely different trajectory and if you go well that's unlikely um, <laughs> we invented electric cars back in 1910 but we headed off into petrol we're capable of some very stupid decisions when enough of us get together so it's not that the right thing will inevitably happen it's just that something will happen and sometimes it's very hard to predict so the problem as I see it is that the internet growth isn't stopping but we've got to fuel it without any more IP addresses and quite frankly when we look at the numbers we're going to see the level of v v6 deployment is nowhere near enough to cut over the demand for addresses while we still had v4 addresses was going at 200 million rising to 300 million here's a plot since 2005 yet we started running out by 2011 2012 and we can actually plot the amount blue of addresses we're feeding into the industry the gap between the red and the blue is the shortfall the cumulative shortfall and by next year 2014 by the end of that year the shortfall is going to be around a billion addresses so the problem is not getting any easier and so do you think this would fuel a massive and rapid rise in the deployment of v6 well you'd like to think so but you'd be wrong because according to Google stats only 1.2 percent of users used v6 to access Google's website and when we look at a map of the world using a similar test that we've been doing in APNIC over the same period what we see is some countries have managed to get breathtakingly more than 0.6 percent of their users using v6 but a huge amount of the world isn't and so this is a very very patchy transition in percentage terms Romania has almost 10 percent of its population using v6 Luxembourg well it's only half a million people six percent France Japan Germany you could read this as well as I can and yes there is the United States of America the average 1.2 percent is actually picked up by only 10 countries the other 190 aren't so even in absolute terms where we actually look at the 
estimated number of V6 users and quite phenomenally that's 6 million in America 4.3 million in China 3 million in Japan those are very very big numbers but on the other hand if you look at the number of internet users in those countries there is still a very very long way to go some countries have heard the message the United States has certainly heard it and is moving inexorably it's good news but if you think about it for a second that graph spans two years how long will it take to get to 100 percent that curve over at the right needs to become a lot more vertical than it is now uptake needs to happen much faster in France one provider free is running v6 has around 4.85 percent market share the others France Telecom hmm and what's that drop at the end? China. There's a big switch in China. And when the ICANN meeting was coming on in the April of it last week, it seems that someone turned on the big switch, let them have V6. And as soon as everyone leaves, it seems the switch gets turned off again. It's a remarkably strange graph, that one. So overall, it seems that when we look at this, Phenomenally, you know, half of the internet's long haul transit ISPs, the thing that gets you around the country and around the world, 50% of them support V6 transit. It's brilliant. And, you know, Microsoft and Apple and everyone else have done an enormous amount of work in devices. As far as we can see, at least half of the internet's end devices have an active V6 stack, and the rest, well, they run Windows XP. Um, but when we combine those, what we actually find is that around 1% of the users, only 1% you know, use V6. So the problem is in this last mile infrastructure. We've done two out of three, but the access industry is getting very slow. So why do we wait? Why is this taking so long? It seems that once more, economics is the problem, that we've failed to understand the business dynamics of V6. So what we've got now is a period of considerable uncertainty for this industry, a period where nothing is sure. So what's the question? How long will this transition take? Will it get quick cheaper? If we deploy CGNs, how long do I need to keep on deploying these CGNs? The questions this industry asks itself are legion, and we're not sure of what the answers are. So where is all this heading? I don't think we can shelve this for decades. We really need to make a decision now. We're either going to squash everything into HTTP, we're going to make a world of carrier grade NATs and application level gateways, or we're going to build an end-to-end -end network. So we need to think very carefully about what we want in a world where silicon isn't going to stop, where content, computation, storage and communications are just abundant and openly available commodities, where a broadband network that, that delivers gigabits is not just a dream but a reality. And behind that is basically computation and storage that's appropriate for that kind of scale of communication. That's what we'd like, but it's not yet clear which way market forces are going to lead us. So if we really want this open platform, how can we achieve that? How can we ensure that the industry maintains a collective focus on V6, that that first 2% is followed by the trailing 98%? How can we make sure we don't get distracted to optimize carrier grade NATs, application level gateways, and various band-aids that ensure that we can compress more and more people into fewer and fewer V4 addresses. How can we get through this transition? Or at the very least, how can we make it any worse than it is now? That was a blank slide because it's hard. I really don't know what will work. And, you know, as far as I can see, no one else does either. So even though I don't know what will work, I'd like to leave you with just three thoughts. Firstly, it's not a case of trying to make transition technologies work forever. It's not a case of building a cute map E, map M, map Z. What we want to build ultimately is V6. So 
if we all are going to do that, we all need to understand what our common interests are. The interests of manufacturers, the interests of content providers, the interests of carriage providers, the interests of last mile access networks. Because we've got this disparate industry that is tugging in every single different direction. Yet what we'd really like to see is where the common interest lies in building a future that remains open, remains neutral, remains accessible and functional as a network as a communications infrastructure that you can do anything. There's been a lot of talk about address markets and uh, scarcity and the issues of hoarding and pricing. Um, it's true, addresses are there to achieve networking. Scarcity generates pain and uncertainty and hoarding just exacerbates that. So address markets should really be avoided but on the other hand I'm not sure how we avoid them. So the best I can say is build the market openly. Closed and opaque address markets create information models that are asymmetric. It encourages speculation and hoarding and exacerbates the problem. So if we want to get through this transition try and make sure that markets operate as openly as possible and as efficiently as possible. And I've also seen a huge amount of work trying to delay this, uh, this uh, problem, trying to delay the point at which we actually get into address, address exhaustion. Bring it on. Because the longer we take in transition, the more we forget about the fact that transition is purely temporary, the more we forget about the fact that IPv6 truly is the objective. Because quite frankly, if we get this wrong, the network won't stop. If we get this wrong, we'll just rebuild that old stifling, vertically bundled carriage monopoly. We will rebuild the old AT&Ts of the past. We will rebuild a network that was only good for just one thing and only one thing. We can do that. We're good at exhaustion. We've stuffed things up and civilized